Okay, well, why don't we, uh, why don't we get started now? Um, I'd like to welcome everyone to this um, discussion webinar series. Uh, we're planning on this to be a monthly event. And this is an initiative of the Earth Commission, of the Ames Program in um, uh, Future Earth, and of the new Lighthouse Activity and Safe Landing Climates in the World Climate Research Program. Um, and our objective is to introduce tipping points today and then have a monthly series of events where we go through individual tipping points. And the next one we plan is on uh, those to do with ice. Um, tipping points are, are not a new thing. They're inherent in climate models going all the way back to Budiko, who finds multiple equilibria. Uh, but they've always kind of uh, sat a little bit awkwardly, perhaps alongside mainstream climate science using climate models. Uh, but I think those things are starting to come together. We've seen the last IPCC report has uh, really highlighted tipping points in their uh, summary for policymakers. And judging from the response to this, which is uh, over 500 people signing up, uh, it looks like there may have been a tipping point on, on tipping points. And so uh, we think it's a great time to have this series and I thank you all for joining us. And um, I'm now going to hand, oh, one thing I should say is that uh, at the end of this, we're, we, we want this to be um, something that engenders discussion across communities and maybe builds a, a community on tipping points, which can help us to move forward on the subject of how to, how to deal with these things, how to understand them better, how to incorporate them into our projections and our uh, contingency planning. So um, having said that, I'm gonna pass you all over now to Ricardo Winkelmann, who's gonna introduce uh, what today's event is going to be. And uh, so thank you, Ricardo. Yeah, thanks so much, Steve, and a warm welcome also from my side. I'm really excited that we um, can today kick off this discussion series on tipping elements. And today we will actually get a, a good overview of all the different tipping elements. And as uh, Stephen already mentioned, we will then month after month go um, into more depth on the individual tipping elements um, in the climate system. And it's my pleasure um, to introduce our first speaker for today. Um, Professor Tim Lenton from the University of Exeter. Exeter. He's a director of the Global Systems Institute and also the chair in climate change and earth system science at the University of Exeter. He's an award-winning expert on tipping elements in the climate system. And he's also done a lot of pivotal work on positive social tipping towards sustainability. Um, he's also a member of the Earth Commission, which is part of the Global Commons Alliance and will today present some of the recent work uh, from the Earth Commission Working Group 1. So we're very much looking forward to this update on tipping elements in the climate system. And Tim, the floor is yours. Thanks, Ricardo. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, everybody, for turning up to engage on this uh, important topic. It is nice to suddenly have 245 <laughs> participants interested uh, to talk about tipping points. It, it wasn't quite like that when we started 15 years ago, uh, but, but the earth systems changed as well as the times. So yeah, I hope you're seeing the full screen okay. Yeah, all good. Um, credit to David Armstrong McKay as my co-author here, summarizing work that lots of others have been inputting to a work in progress to a degree. Um, but an update hopefully on the tipping elements in the climate system. So first, a little toy model or movie um, to get our eye in of a, a generic model of a system that is gonna pass a tipping point because as well as being subjected to some short-term stochastic noise that's moving the ball around in a valley, I'm also forcing the system such that the attractor it started in is losing stability. And on my computer, it just got tipped into an alternative attractor. Um, so this is the kind of canonical toy model I guess we often use for tipping dynamics. It's a particular type of bifurcation in the language of mathematics. I think the key points to lock in on here is, yeah, a tipping point is where a small change makes a big difference to the state or fate, in this case, a part of the climate system. Um, crucial to that is the concept that self-perpetuating 
strong mathematically positive feedbacks uh, can sometimes rule the dynamics as a tipping point and propel that transition between different states. We've just seen a toy model there where it happens quite fast and in an irreversible fashion. Reversible transitions are possible as a special case and the speed of transformation should, is governed by the nature of the bit of the climate system we're talking about. And some things are intrinsically slow, like ice sheets or the overall ocean circulation. Other things like atmospheric dynamics, we all know, are intrinsically fast. Um, this is a, a version of the, the early or, or not quite original map of the tipping elements, but this is sort of 10 years old version of, of the map that I want to try and give us a little update on today. Um, you can see we it's divided in this early version between tipping elements involving melting of ice in blue, circulation changes in red, and loss of biomes in green. Um, I guess the important points to, to note are when we originally drew up the list and the maps of tipping points, we drew it from at least three sources. Was there paleoclimate evidence for abrupt change in a part of the climate system? Was there detailed process-based climate model evidence for abrupt and or irreversible change? Or did we just have a core theoretical understanding of the feedbacks in, the, in these bits of the climate system that would lead us to think they could get strong enough to sometimes exhibit tipping point change? Well, in the last 10 years, uh, we've learned a lot more, of course, and I would say that observational data in its various forms is helping us inform a, a revisit to this map and this list. I always thought it would be a provisional map with some question marks on it and some uncertainties. Um, back in the day, <laughs> 10 or so years ago, as also part of setting up this expert elicitation exercise that tried to extract information on probabilities of for five different candidate tipping elements in the climate system. And even then we thought there was probably 10. Uh, so it's in, incomplete in that sense. And of course, one might take different views on the value or not of eliciting information from experts, but even then, um, the salient messages are coming back and summarised on the side there that, that tipping points were not high impact, low probability events, according to the 50 odd experts in this elicitation. In fact, if we carried on business as usual, they would become high impact, high probability events. But clearly, 10 or so years on, we need to update our uh, likelihood assessment, shall we say, as well as our list. And we've got, you know, in the last decade or so, some great new information, um, great in a scientific sense, not so great in a uh, emotional sense. Um, and this study, I'll just highlight uh, by Stephen Dreyfeld, Sebastian Bassiani and others, which systematically scanned the CMIT-5 uh, model database to look for abrupt shifts occurring within the models and found a bunch of them. Um, and uh, uh, alarmingly, a bunch of them clustered at one to one and a half or one and a half to two degrees of warming above pre-industrial. Um, there would be a load more at high temperatures, but there aren't so many scenarios going up to high warming. So you have to mentally reweight the distribution if you want. But yeah, that's one interesting and important source of additional information on possible temperature thresholds and possible candidate tipping elements, some of which might make it on the map in a minute. Um, there's also, of course, things that aren't represented even now in CMIP-6 models, and so we have to turn to sort of offline models of often for the ice sheets, for example, to get some assessments on their tipping likelihood. Anyway, as of a couple of years ago, this was my summary of what different burning embers diagrams in different IPCC reports uh, were saying for the likelihood of tipping points at different temperature levels. And 01, 07, 13 are uh, uh, the main assessment reports. And 2019 here actually refers to both the, the special report 1.5 degrees C in 2018 and the special report on oceans and the cryosphere 2019. But the key point is that over the last 20 years, uh, our collective assessment of tipping point likelihoods has raised the alarm flags or bells because we've gone from thinking uh, these would only be sort of as likely as not at four or five degrees C of warming to we're in the danger zone at one to two degrees C of warming. And uh, that's partly because we're seeing accelerating change 
in the wrong direction, if you like, in various previously identified elements, tipping elements in the climate system. Uh, perhaps the most direct or striking evidence for actually having passed the tipping point would be for a cup for glaciers, a couple of glaciers draining into the Amundsen Sea embayment in West Antarctica, showing all the signs of a reversible grounding line retreat. But yeah, several other elements where you might try and comfort yourselves and say maybe they're changing at an accelerating rate because the forcing is accelerating. But as we'll see, there's some, these are all things where we have some good reasons to think that um, self-propelling feedbacks are, are, can get strong in these systems and there can be tipping dynamics. So a couple of years ago, also quickly summarized, okay, we know something empirically about how these things are causally coupled together. Um, and in the interest of time, I might not just, I might not run through all the details of potential causal couplings, but as some of you will be familiar, I mean, we know the Arctic's warming two or three times as fast as the global average, largely because of the accelerating sea ice retreat. We know the extra Arctic warming is a contributor to the extra Greenland ice sheet melt and to the extra precipitation that's happening in the Arctic. Both of those sources of fresh water are freshening up the North Atlantic plausibly contributing to the slowdown of the Atlantic overturning circulation. We know from the paleo record that as that slows down, we drag the global monsoon or the intertropical conversion zone or whatever IPCC want to call it now southwards. And we're leaving heat behind in the Southern Ocean at the same time, and that threatens the ice sheets down there. But that's enough about uh, what's already out there in the literature. What David and I and others are working on is a new categorization of uh, tipping elements. So we decided we'd split the list and if you like the maps into global core tipping elements, we're calling them, and then something we might call regional impact tipping elements. I'm sure these boundaries or definition boundaries are blurred, but on global core tipping elements, we're gonna have a look at what we think contributes significantly to the overall mode of the operation of the earth system, um, such that basically, change it, tipping it modifies the qualitative state of the whole uh, system. So then we're really looking for, there's a spatially coherent, large scale, subcontinental scale tipping uh, going on and, and or as a possible alternative case, really truly global impacts of some what perhaps synchronous crossing of a smaller spatial scale tipping point in a system. And then in the regional impact tipping element, list with concentrating on things which maybe we're not totally convinced about there they would change the whole operation of the whole earth system but we are convinced that they contribute significantly to human welfare in a way that tipping them is going to impact lots of people and then we've got some things we'll see in a minute which is where we've we've changed some things to a list of uncertain tipping elements where uncertain is meant to to imply well we've got some evidence for this crucial self-perpetuating feedback large scale threshold, but only for maybe one or two sources. So big question mark. Whereas unlikely is where we're sort of seeing a lack of evidence for strong self-perpetuating feedback and true temperature threshold. And then threshold free feedbacks is another way of saying probably definitely not a tipping element because although there's strong positive feedback, it never gets strong enough to give threshold behavior. So this is what we've got on global core uh, tipping elements. Uh, this is a work in progress and it's nice to do a seminar on it. It's the first time we've shown this stuff. So email me or Dave and give us your feedback. Um, some things are here that have always been here. Uh, the Greenland ice sheet, the West Antarctic ice sheet, the Amazon rainforest, the AMOC, the Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation. Um, a few, there are a few new entries on the list though. So I think uh, what's become clear in the last decade is that there's a shift in the subpolar gyre in the North Atlantic involving potentially the collapse of deep convection in the Labrador Sea is a distinct thing from uh, AMOC collapse. They can be linked together. They sort of obviously are in some physical sense, but it is a distinct tipping phenomenon. Um, it has its own impacts. They might be less acute than AMOC collapse, but they're significant enough to get on this map. Um, uh, you'll see Arctic winter sea ice survives, I think, as a core tipping element, although it needs quite a lot of warming to happen, and it's at the upper limit of what we could hit in the 20, uh, 21st century. 
boreal forest, boreal permafrost, sorry, is going to creep on, up on these maps multiply because we think there are different parts or phenomena within the boreal permafrost. Uh, and if, if we can convince ourselves that there's a potential for self-propelling collapse where um, essentially the biochemical heat released is from thawing some of the permafrost is enough to thaw more in a location and more and more and more what some people have called compost bomb instability and which some models suggest is possible um, then that's that would happen in the most carbon dense bits of the permafrost like the Yodoma region in Siberia and could be could classify as a global core tipping element then down here in Antarctica you'll see some new entries we've got marine grounded East Antarctic subglacial basins like the Wilkes Basin as a potential core global tipping element, uh, not least because there's uh, quite a lot of sea level rise locked up in those. And then at high levels of warming, okay, it has to be eight or nine degrees C global mean, um, there is a risk of uh, tipping self-perpetuating feedbacks for the, part, for the East Antarctic ice sheet. So we might, some might argue, okay, that's not going to happen until high warming scenario 22nd century, but I still think we should be, we should be on the map in some sense. On the regional impact tipping elements, well, you'll see some things have moved here, and they might move back to the global core, but for example, boreal forest dieback, um, at the moment we would see as a regional impact tipping element, although it's feedback you know, potential carbon release feedback to global temperature is not trivial. Certainly could be in the tens of billions of tons of CO2 equivalents. Um, also, the, West, the moment we're putting West African monsoon and Sahel, uh, possible Sahel vegetation, coupled changes and dust changes at the regional impact tipping element, but we're, it, that one could make it back on the global core map because some recent studies really show the global implications if we have a say a, a scenario of wetting up and re-greening of the Sahel, changing of dust sources from, from there. Um, then we've got some new entries, I think. So the Southern Ocean sea ice potential for abrupt shifts comes out of the CMIP-5 abrupt shifts analysis. Um, the, as for the Barents sea ice, well, that's sort of being seen in observations that we're losing the year-round ice cover there. There's coupled changes in ocean circulation and atmospheric circulation, but there, you know, there might be about several hundred kilometers or thousand kilometer scale, but the impacts are arguably regional. And then another different bit of the boreal permafrost, perhaps think of this as the thermocast, but where you've got the potential for abrupt thaw, but it wouldn't necessarily happen synchronously over a massive area. It's happening at different times in different places. And then finally, things that might have been uh, in purple or pink, I'm not sure, purpley colour, is things that might have got relegated, as it were, or were more uncertain than we were about their tipping element status. So if we just try and look at some purple stuff first, I think the big one that used to be on the map, Indian summer monsoon, there's still you know, evidence that it could have a, a tipping point, but with the calibration with current data, if you like, um, a simple model would suggest it's not got a tipping point. So that's up for debate, I think is the point, but not struck off completely. Um, then we've got some things like the Indian Ocean upwelling, abrupt change, or the changes in the Antarctic bottom water formation, which one sees in maybe one or possibly two models, but we maybe need to see it in more models to get it on the main maps. Then some things in blue, unlikely to be tipping elements. Well, the, one of the big ones here from the original map would be the El Nino Southern Oscillation, with um, maybe a point for discussion. I mean, we know it's got nonlinear dynamics, but we're not sure from what the evidence we've compiled that it, it's at risk of a clear tipping point in future scenarios and uh, arctic ozone hole unlikely to be a tipping element now because of the way that uh, that say um, for example well we don't think it is from the current climate and sort of cfc trajectory and then we've got things that like the tibetan plateau snowmelt that happens in some of the cmip5 models but it's Unlikely in that case, because although it's a clear threshold behavior, um, it doesn't seem to have its own self-perpetuating feedback. And then threshold-free feedbacks or not tipping elements, the, 
the one that's been much discussed in the literature. I think we relegate the Arctic summer sea ice loss to having yeah, strong feedback within it, but not strong enough to have a clear threshold. And I would also say marine hydrates or clathrates, for sure they're important, but it's different thresholds at different times, hundreds of years into the future. It's not a clear uh, tipping element. Well, I could say more on those, but that's probably giving you enough of the taster of, of the classification. Here's a slide to dwell on. This is from uh, David's mostly, but our careful, rigorous review of the literature. What information have we got? Predominantly from models for temperature thresholds at which a tipping point basically is crossed in any of these systems. So apologies for the liberal use of acronyms, which are sort of defined up in the key here. But what you see is a blue dot for our best estimate of a temperature threshold for each system. Orange for like the minimum temperature temperature threshold. That will be because one model does it at that at that level. And grey, the max, is like the model, if you like, that's got the highest uh, temperature threshold in each case. Uh, I'll let you kind of uh, gaze at that for a minute. But I suppose the key point is, oh dear, look at look at the evidence that some models, not all, but just some models are showing temperature thresholds, tipping thresholds at very low levels of warming. And as a comparator, we put on the right the May 2021 Climate Action Tracker update on what levels of warming are we actually heading to, depending on whether countries meet their NDC pledges and so on and so forth. I think we all know that we're heading, well, you take your, take your pick, but we still seem to be heading potentially to three degrees C of warming. Best case, maybe two and a half. Let's hope in November we'll get to a better place than that. But I suppose the salient point here is we might, we're in the danger zone already for several tipping elements. And we look to be definitely in the danger zone at one and a half degrees C of warming for a couple of major ice sheets here, Greenland and West Antarctica. And even if we say, no, that's overly pessimistic, Tim and Dave, um, I'm only going to look at the grey the grey blobs, um, by the time you get to two degrees C of warming, you've got a couple of, uh, you've got a couple of tipping elements where uh, they might be consigned to doom. And we know that for the coral reefs already, but Barents sea ice could be another case. So with the help of a couple of other working group one Earth Commission members, here is an attempt to put, if we, if we think our best guess, which was I think the blue dots on the previous plot, was right. Um, let's see when the tipping points are crossed on either RCP 2.6 in blue or RCP 8.5 in red. And we don't show the detail for seven in orange and 4.5 in kind of turquoise. And each this a big blob is like oh several tipping elements shared a 1.5 degrees C best guess threshold. And obviously the red the red line is the sort of range between the orange and the grey dots on the previous plot, the sort of range of possible thresholds for those systems. Um, what do we take from this? Well, we can debate if we got the temperature thresholds right, but interesting things start to pop out. On RCP 2.6, we're still at risk of crossing thresholds for Greenland, West Antarctica, part of the permafrost, the coral reefs, um, unless we've got the estimate, the best estimate wrong and the barren sea ice comes in as well. Um, but it's delayed from when it would happen on the high, uh, high emissions trajectory, delayed quite a bit if we've got, it, got the threshold right. And of course, on the high emissions trajectory, you just carry on hitting other tipping elements or tipping points that could be in principle avoided uh, on the low warming trajectory. Perhaps no qualitative surprise there, but look at the number of them you could keep on hitting if, if, uh, if we were to go down a sort of uh, gratuitous fossil fuel burning future, which many of us think now we won't. But you can imagine that the intermediate scenarios still, still have several more crossings than the low emission scenario. And just to show that in a different way, this is uh, tipping, if we take again our best estimates of what the temperature thresholds are, this is tipping point crossing over time by SSP. So we've got to get our eye in on the colours. The lowest emissions is the darker blue, the highest emissions is the red. This is time from 2020. 
um, okay, nothing seems to get crossed by 2030. I'm uh, not sure whether we've got that wrong or right. But then as you get into the 2030 to 2040, well, if you're on the higher emission scenarios, they already begin to distinguish themselves. If we've got these threshold guesses right, they can cross quite a few tipping points on the high emissions that you avoid on the low emissions. Unfortunately, come up to 2050, 30 years time, and there's still going to be some transgressions on the low emission scenario, but a lot less than on the high emissions. And they've continued to differentiate themselves. There's still risk of crossing one more maybe on uh, lowest emissions of the four we consider, but they just keep accumulating on the high emissions. Okay, I don't know if I use my 20 minutes yet, Rika. Have I, can you give me some fingers? How many minutes have I got left? Not or? <laughs> You're good, Tim. Uh, maybe you okay. <laughs> so then I'll say I'll, I'll talk about one more little one more thing, which is could we get some extra information on tipping point likelihood to add to all these other sources of information from the fact that we should expect there to be early warning signals, but for, under various conditions for some you know for some tipping points, not for all. So what we saw with the same movie as before there was this phenomenon that by eye you should have seen the ball was slowing down, rolling back as it were slower before the tipping point was reached because really what, was, what we expect before a tipping point is that restoring negative feedbacks in a system and losing strength and, and the self-propelling positive feedbacks are about to take over at the tipping point. And there's various ways we can, should be able to extract the signal of this losing the ability to recover from short-term fluctuations. And the red line at the bottom is one way of doing that. You see a system become more self-similar in time. It's recovering more slowly from perturbations. There are a raft of caveats about when this can or can't be used as a method. Um, and I don't have time to walk through all of those caveats, but I'm just putting this up there to note that several recent studies uh, are starting to show um, I would argue statistically robust uh, early warning signal of slowing of recovery from short term fluctuations, which is at least consistent. Uh, it doesn't tell you that the tipping point is coming, but it's consistent with the possibility of a tipping point. And I would only say we should use this where we have, as scientists, lots of good other reasons to think that the system we're looking at really could exhibit a tipping point. That should be our first filter here. And so you might say for the September sea ice, it fails that test, but it is striking that it shows the slowing down signal. Whereas for the Greenland ice sheet and the Atlantic overturning, I think we have very compelling evidence they can exhibit tipping points. And this is just one extra source of sanity check, perhaps, that uh, if we think they're approaching a tipping point, indeed, they show early warning signals consistent with that. And in the case of Nicholas Bors and Martin Riptel's Greenland analysis, they make some very interesting projections of where that tipping point might be, which we can discuss. But my point is simply, here's an extra source of information, and it's not published yet. So I say this with that caveat that we've been analysing data from the, what's called vegetation optical depth of the Amazon rainforest, which can be thought of as a proxy for biomass, although it's actually really water content of the trees. And what you see in red is places where lag one water correlation in time, this slowing down signal is, is increasing since the early 2000s in the Amazon. Blue is where it's decreasing, so getting more stable nominally, but unfortunately red very clearly dominates across the basin. Um, so that's consistent with the Amazon is losing stability at, at the very least. And just to finish up, I wanted to try and make a segue to Sonia. I, want, I just wanted to note that one of the other very general properties of systems approaching these kind of bifurcation tipping points is if the system is subject, if you're subject to a lot of noise, let's say you've got a lot of internal climate variability, then a phenomenon that can happen uh, is what's called flickering, right? Dynamical systems people. It's that like there's another new attractor for a system. It's maybe not yet stable or it's only marginally stable but a system can start to flicker into that attractor, briefly sample it, and then fall back to the normal, uh, well-known state before that other attractor becomes the norm. And I just wanted to finish by you know, floating the thought that um, do we need to think about our interpretation of some recent uh, well-known now extreme events that have happened this summer, for example, or earlier, 
in the light of the possibility that they might be interpreted as flickering towards sampling a new tractor for a new, let's say, weather regime. And this is one pub well published study on one, in my eye, possible candidate for that, which is Mongolian heat waves, if you like, and drought events have suddenly become much more extreme uh, in the last couple of decades. And the coupling between drying and warming in the events has suddenly asserted itself. And this is a well-known reinforcing positive feedback that I expect Sonia will tell us more about, that when we have a, uh, we can get a self-reinforcing drought when the land surface dries out and the heat dome in the atmosphere builds up. Enough from me though. My summary, uh, the take home from the work we're doing as the Earth Commission is uh, if we put all our other thoughts aside, our assessment of a safe level of global warming to minimize the risk of tipping points is unfortunately at about one degree C of global warming that we're already past. But you know, if you carry on warming things up by 1.5 major ice sheets are at risk, go from 1.5 to two degrees C and several more things are at risk. And then the risks for several more, more things are at risk as you go above two degrees C. Um, I'll leave it there. Thanks a lot. Thanks so much, Tim, for, for your brilliant talk and the excellent overview for all the different climate tipping elements. I'm sure there are lots of questions and we encourage you to post those in the Q&A box and we will get back to those um, after we hear from our second speaker and we will have a joint discussion afterwards. So uh, for now, let me introduce our second speaker, Professor Sonja Sene-Biratne. She's a climate scientist and professor at the Institute for Atmospheric and Climate Science of ETH Zurich. She's a specialist um, of climate extremes and land climate interactions, and in her work combines climate modeling and data analysis. Sonia is highly cited and has received several awards for her research. Uh, she's also an author on several reports of the IPCC, and so we're very much looking forward to her insights from IPCC AR6 on extreme events in a changing climate. Sonia, please go ahead. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Ricarda, for the kind introduction and also the organizers uh, for the invitation. So I will speak about extreme events in a changing climate and mostly presenting main insights from the IPCC AR6. Uh, and I will also make some links to, to evidence on the uh, tipping point. Um, so I just want first to acknowledge the, all the authors of our chapter, uh, the chapter 11 on climate extremes. I will be showing a lot of the material from that chapter. I coordinated the chapter together with uh, Xubin Zhang from Environment Canada. Uh, I first wanted to mention some general evidence from the report, which I think is important to, to remember. First, we already had 1.1 uh, degree of global warming in the last decade. So we are really getting very close to 1.5 degree of global warming. Uh, this warming rate is unprecedented in more than 2000 years and the temperature level is unprecedented in more than 100,000 years. So we are really in truly extraordinary conditions. We need to be aware of this. And I think when we talk about uh, tipping points, obviously one main issue is the uncertainty that we have. And I would say their uncertainty is not our friend because we, we cannot really validate the models for the type of conditions we are having right now. The largest part of this uh, warming is irreversible for several generations. So of course, there are some changes in the climate system that are irreversible, but the global warming itself, let's say that we would find that we reach a, a global warming level where we are starting to see very large changes. And maybe that's what we are saying when we consider what has happened this summer. The problem is that CO2 has a very, very long lifetime. In addition to this, there are also additional feedbacks that uh, retains a level of global warming for several decades. So for instance, these experiments from the Zero Emission Commitment Experiments, ECMIP, shows that after reaching net zero CO2, most of the global warming generally remains for about more than 100 years. So you see that the median of the model here show almost no decrease uh, in the global mean temperature for, for several decades. So we, of course, we need to, to keep this also in mind. Now, regarding climate extremes, uh, we have uh, assessments about observed changes in extremes and their projections. Uh, regarding the, the observed changes, we see that uh, the evidence of observed changes in extremes has strengthened. So clearly here, we have much stronger evidence compared to ER5. 
Um, and we also see that human-induced climate change is already affecting many weather and climate extremes in every region across the world. And I think that's a really important message. It's not that just a few regions are being affected, but really all regions of the world are being affected. In terms of the assessment in the IPCC report, we looked at temperature extremes, heavy precipitation, floods, droughts, storms, and compound events. This is also an important point. That's uh, basically events which are uh, uh, affected by several different extremes at the same time. What we see also in recent years is that some recent uh, hot event uh, if, would have been extremely unlikely to occur without human influence on the climate system. So what we have seen in recent years, and we are starting basically to experience, are that some events happen where we can say these are truly outside the variability, variability we had before. So it's not only about having extreme events which are becoming more frequent, but some are become so much more intense that we can say Without human influence, we know that it would have almost no probability of happening. Some examples of recent events that were made more likely because of human-induced climate change, I just included a few of these. I always show this slide, I always have to, to keep on updating it because there are so many events happening, even just this summer. But here are a few examples, 2019 and summer, for the first time, 46 degrees were reached in France. Uh, there were major fire events, for instance, in Australia between December and January 2019-2020. I think we have all seen those apocalyptic pictures. And uh, there were also impacts on the carbon cycle. There was uh, about two-thirds of the CO2 emissions associated with this event. Uh, was it, the emissions associated with this event correspond to about two-thirds of the emissions of the country per year. Uh, in 2020, there were also fires and a heat wave in Siberia. And this summer, I think this was particularly dramatic. We have seen this uh, heat wave in Canada, where a temperature of 49 degrees 0.5 was reached, uh, and the town was burned down in, in one day. Uh, there was a very severe floods in Germany. Um, and then, for instance, in, in the Mediterranean, there were also severe heat waves and, and fires, and there would be much more events to mention, for instance, floods in China, also floods in New York associated with tropical cyclone. So in terms of the assessment that we have uh, in the report, we, we have different maps where we have been looking at uh, observed changes uh, different in different regions. And in terms of hot extremes, we have very clear evidence that hot extremes have become more frequent. Uh, and uh, more intense across most land regions. And as there is high confidence that human-induced climate change is the main driver for these changes. I think the main message here is really almost all regions are affected. That's very clear. For heavy precipitation uh, events, uh, we see also that the frequency and intensity of heavy precipitation events have increased. Um, and uh, for most land area for which we have observational data, that is sufficient because we need daily data. And that's all the regions which are not shown in gray in this figure. And you see basically in the majority of those regions we see uh, in the observation increase in heavy precipitation. We have also much more evidence on changes in droughts. We have assessed in the report different types of droughts. Here's a map for changes in agricultural and ecological droughts. These are droughts that are associated with lack of soil moisture and associated uh, measures which impact ecosystems and agriculture. And in several regions, we see from observations that these droughts have become uh, more frequent uh, or more intense. In terms of tropical cyclones, uh, it is likely that the global proportion of the major tropical cyclone occurrence uh, has increased over the last four decades, and this change cannot be explained by internal variability alone. And human influence is likely to increase, increase, increase the change of compound events. Uh, since the 1950s. That's a topic on which we really have new evidence in the report. Uh, for instance, there is an increase in the frequency of concurrent heat waves and droughts and the global scale. Also an increase in fire weather in some regions of all inhabited continents and increase in compound flooding in some locations. So the fact that you have more compound flooding, for instance, in coastal areas because of the combined effects of sea level rise and increase in heavy precipitation. So I'll say a few words also about projected changes in extremes as function of global warming. Um, so like we've seen also for tipping elements, obviously the change in extremes increase with increasing global warming. And that's also our main conclusions. You know, any additional increment of global warming leads to more changes in climate extremes. 
And we see that this increase uh, found, for instance, for hot extremes, marine heat waves, heavy precipitation, agricultural and ecological droughts in some regions, and the proportion of intense tropical cyclones. Um, I'm going to show some uh, of the conclusions we have in the summary for policy maker and the fact that the frequency is increasing uh, very substantially. So for instance, here we are looking at the change in frequency of an event that would have happened once every 10 years without human-induced climate change. Such, a, such an event at present climate of about one degree would be three times more likely. And at 1.5 degrees would be four times more likely. And at two degrees, about six times more likely. And at four degrees would almost happen every year. Uh, we see, of course, also that the intensity of those events is increasing. And if you look at the level of uh, increase, these numbers are higher than the mean global warming because uh, land temperature is increasing more than ocean temperatures. Another important point is if you are looking at very rare events, so that would have also very large impacts, the increase in frequency is larger than for the less rare events. So if you take the one in 50 year event, um, so the event that would have happened only once every 50 years without human-induced climate change, this event is made five times more likely in present climate compared to three times more likely for the one in 10 year event. So obviously, particularly for the very rare, very extreme events, we see a very strong increase in frequency. We see also similar uh, results for changes in heavy precipitation with uh, an increase in frequency, with increase in global warming, and also an increase in intensity that is more or less following clouds clapperons, so about 7% uh, of increase in intensity for each degree of global warming. Also for droughts there, uh, it's not a global signal. There are regions that are showing an average uh, drying signal. Those regions are shown here on the map. It includes, for instance, in Europe, also Central Europe uh, and uh, the Mediterranean. And I think of concern, I will mention this afterwards for tipping points, is also several regions where you have important forests that take up a lot of CO2, like the Amazon region. You see in South America, we have several regions which are showing an increase in drying with increasing global warming. And so there, for those regions uh, in, on the present uh, level of global warming, we have almost a doubling of the probability of droughts. And this increase in frequency is getting worse with increasing global warming. And same thing for the intensity. So about compound events uh, and surprises, uh, with further global warming, every region is projected to increasingly experience multiple changes climatic impact drivers, which include extremes. Many regions are projected to experience an increase in probability of compound events with higher global warming. Uh, so for instance, concurrent heat waves and droughts are uh, likely to become more frequent. We also have further increases of fires and compound, compound flooding. And one thing personally is that I think could be leading to tipping points is the social system or the economic system, because the fact that we are starting to have more concurrent extremes and multiple locations, uh, which become uh, more likely. We have, for instance, in 2018, there were several heat waves that happened at the same time across the Northern Hemisphere. And we are seeing this more and more this summer, there were several regions affected by extremes at the same time. So for instance, if you're looking at crop producing areas, we see that there is more probability that these areas will be affected by extremes at the same time, a two degree compared to 1.5 degree. And of course, this could affect uh, food security. There will be an increasing occurrence of some extreme events which are unprecedented in the observational record with additional global warming, even at 1.5 degree of global warming. And even extreme events that do not have a particular low probability in the present climate can be perceived as surprise. And I think that's another important message. Is also uh, in some cases we found that events that were perceived as very extreme were actually at the fairly you know, uh, normal probability of happening, uh, but they are perceived as surprise because of the pace of global warming because the changes are so quick. So adaptation cannot keep pace. So about tipping points and irreversibility aspects, uh, some global tipping points are associated with climate extremes. Uh, for instance, the effect of droughts on a global carbon cycle. Uh, I would say in the IPCC report, uh, this. Uh, was not assessed in a lot of tests, but uh, there is a literature, for instance, uh, there was a paper uh, from our group that has shown that 
uh, there is possible underestimation of associated feedbacks in climate models. So what we found was uh, from observations, there is a clear link between how much water you have in the soil on land on average and the increase of CO2 in the atmosphere. Uh, and this correlation is actually underestimated in models. So it, as I mentioned, we know that with increasing global warming, those regions like the Amazon region would be affected by more drought and possibly the models underestimated feedbacks on the carbon cycle. Um, another type of irreversible aspects is uh, without looking at the world climate system is there are of course impacts that are irreversible uh, and which would be associated with higher global warming. So for instance, uh, coral reefs were also mentioned by Tim. Uh, that's uh, from the IPCC special report on 1.5 degree, but at 1.5 degree, you would have losses of about 70 to 90% of coral reefs, which is already dramatic. But at two degree, you would have losses of more than 99%. And obviously this would make you know, a huge difference if you manage to limit global warming around 1.5 degree versus two degree. Uh, also in terms of extinction and decrease in species um, biodiversity, uh, we have a tripling of insects and doubling of plants and vertebrates, which lose more than half of the geographic range at two degrees versus 1.5 degree of global warming. So I think the 1.5 degree report would clearly show that there are major effects of uh, basically going to two degree versus 1.5 degree also in terms of impacts. And of course, these impacts would be irreversible if it's associated with species extinction. So I come to the conclusions. Evidence on extremes has strengthened in the past decade. Uh, no region is spared by a change in extremes. Uh, unprecedented events become more likely with increasing global warming and uh, threats from extremes are multiplying with increasing global warming. Um, regarding irreversibility and tipping points, uh, global warming from CO2 emissions is irreversible for several generations. I think that's an important point to keep in mind. If we find out we are really in a bad situation, it would be diffi very difficult to go back. And regional extremes can trigger global tipping points, so for instance, stress effects on the global carbon cycle. And we see this higher uh, risk of species extinction at 2 degrees versus 1.5 degrees. Uh, and I should say this assessment is not including extremes. So there we should also be aware of maybe what has not been assessed yet. Uh, maybe to comment on the point that Tim mentioned before regarding the feedbacks between uh, droughts uh, and uh, temperature extremes. Obviously we have seen uh, in a lot of analysis that uh, droughts and heat waves are connected. And indeed, I mean, you could have also some regional tipping points where we are starting to shift the regime and go to, to regimes where you have so much uh, limitation in some moisture that this leads to much more heat waves. And actually we are starting to see this already in observations. So I'll come to my main conclusion, which is that we should do all what we can to limit global warming to about 1.5 degree. As there are totally agree with the team that we cannot say that 1.5 degree is actually safe. Uh, I think we have seen also this summer already how many impacts we have also just associated with extremes. But at the moment, it's the best option we have. Thanks for the attention. Yeah, thank you so much, Sonia, for this uh, brilliant presentation. And it's really interesting to see that you have basically this joint conclusion that even 1.5 degrees um, is not safe in terms of uh, tipping points as well as uh, extreme events. So we will now start our Q&A or our discussion. And um, I see that there's already a lively discussion going on in the Q&A box. Um, we have also prepared um, a Myra board for further engagement. And um, I will hand over to Steven. So maybe you want to introduce that. Uh, sure, OK. Um, yeah, as Ricardo said, there's quite a few questions coming in. I see Tim's been busy answering some questions for him. But we wanted to, to try to throw out some of these questions. I, I'm going to start off with, with one, I, I guess, mainly for Tim. Um, you were showing when thresholds would be crossed. but how unambiguous is it what these tipping points mean? Uh, for example, in a model, does crossing you know, some tipping point, does it sometimes lead to a huge impact and sometimes kind of fizzle? How, how, much, how are those two uncertainties comparing? And more generally, you know, what, what can we do to re reduce those uncertainties? Yeah, I think the key extra thing I need to come up with some slides on, Steve, which David and I have been working on is 
well, what is the what we call the transition time scale? Accepting if we accept that we have passed the tipping point in some system, how long does it take for the consequences to unfold? Because that can be that can vary hugely, right? From if you tip a monsoon system, conceivably that could transition very, very quickly, meaning in the order of years. Or whereas if you tip an ice sheet, it might initially just pass the tipping point be committed to change over a time scale of thousands, if not tens of thousands of years, uh, then one needs to ask, uh, is that time scale of the impacts itself sensitive to how far you exceed the tipping point? And for the ice sheets, it's become abundantly clear that it is, and that makes a lot of physical sense. The more we need, you know, the more we warm it up, the more extra heat input we have to melt ice so we can melt it faster. So I think that's, that's the crucial point and the crucial additional piece of information. Steve, you rightly ask as well, um, implicitly, I guess, in the question is also, is it reversible? I mean, you phrase it as could it fizzle? But I mean, if we could imagine a future like we do actually get our act together and we have a peak and decline scenario of warming where we cross 1.5 and then we come back down again, could we rescue the situation for some tipping elements? Well, colleagues at Exeter have written on that and there's short, and there's the possibility for, for slow responding systems, a shortish overshoot means you might be able to rescue the situation. And then just beyond that, I mean, we're all accepting our the scientific limitations here. We don't fully understand these systems. Um, and how how they'll play out. Uh, so I guess that's why we're having these seminars is to help to rally us all together to keep doing better at the science. I'll shut up there. I might jump in and ask a relate. There's a related question from Rich Blaustein, uh, who's uh, maybe for Sonia. Uh, he asks, um, you mentioned warming being locked in, but please offer any reflections on the impact of whether robust negative emissions programs could uh, um bring us back i guess um could that mitigate warning so what's your take on what what we're just talking about here yeah so i mean that's that's a, a difficult point because of course there there, there are some uh, considerations of a so-called uh, junk engineering scheme i think we have to be aware that if we are speaking of for instance solar radiation uh, modification uh, what this is doing so if we were to send sulfates in the uh, stratosphere is that actually it wouldn't match the forcing from greenhouse gases. So what we would in effect do, we would create novel climate. We might even create maybe novel tipping points. Uh, I think this would be, you know, a very uh, dangerous. Plus, I mean, this would require coordination globally. And we are seeing already it's so difficult to have coordination for CO2 mitigation. I don't see how we would coordinate SRM. So, and plus, of course, some studies have shown that it could also disrupt monsoon precipitation. So I think it's just, yeah, of course, you can hypothetically think about what could potentially be done, but so far as evidence is not clear that this wouldn't be safe and be an actual solution. Uh, so, I mean, I mean, to me, it seems a bit absurd. I mean, we know we have a problem. We know what is the root of the problem. We are meeting CO2, this is leading to push our climate system out of balance in a regime we have never known, you know, for more than 100,000 years. Obviously, we are putting us into the unknown. We are putting us into risk, and tipping points is part of it in the physical system. But there are other tipping points as kind of alluded to, like I think the social systems. Again, if you have extremes happening at the same time in different locations, don't think this has been very much assessed, but. If you have, you know, food production affected everywhere, maybe this, this is a type of a tipping point that could be affected even before your physical system shows a tipping point. And we just have to avoid this at all costs. That would be my message. Yeah. I just want to back Sonia up on that 100%. And just on this issue of carbon dioxide removal, I mean, my worry is that what we're doing there is we're just uh, yet again coming up with a reason to delay and to think we can overshoot and then drag things back. My worry is a justice uh, worry there because the people who are going to get hurt by the overshoot are 
are poorer people in simple terms and the people who have been advocating for the oh we're going to have this massive carbon dioxide removal technology when we're all going to be spectacularly rich in the second half of this century are already rich people so i think there's a real serious issue of climate justice in in some of the uh, some of the groups and some of the arguments made for delay now you know, magic up carbon dioxide removal later yeah, mm -hmm. if I can just add one point, because I only commented in SRM, but not uh, CDR, but on carbon dioxide removal, uh, obviously some of the scenarios IPCC include, include some aspects, but I think we need to be aware the main scenarios don't have more than about 10% of CDR. So, I mean, in any case, we need to reduce emissions by 90%. That would be my main message. Thank you. Picking up on a question from the Q and A um, that Fabian Davlanda posed, uh, which was, uh, "What's the relative important uh, importance of bifurcation versus rate-induced tipping?" And uh, maybe just adding to that, what is the relative importance then of, of noise-induced uh, tipping or even event-induced tipping? Because that could potentially link the two topics of tipping points and then extreme events. And Sonia, you also mentioned um, compound extreme events. So, so what's your take on this, on, on the relative importance of these different tipping mechanisms? I'll give a quick go at it. So not sure all the audience will be totally familiar with that terminology. So shall I quick, I'm going to give a quick go. Um, I, I showed you a, a cartoon of what we call bifurcation tipping. This phenomenon of rate-induced tipping is the idea that for some systems, um, if you push them fast enough, let's say you warn them fast enough, you can cause them to undergo a long transient change. It might not technically be to some other state. Eventually you might return to where you are, but you get all these damages and bad things in the transient change. And then this thing called noise induced tipping, that's the idea like there are two valleys, you're in one of them, maybe it's a little bit shallow and the hill between them isn't that high. And if you have enough internal variability in the climate, you get knocked out of the one valley or state over the hill and into the other. And that's where Sonia and my science really intersects, because we know the extreme events are getting more extreme and therefore in some key areas. And therefore, the risk of getting knocked out of a state into another one is going up simply because the noise level is going up in simple terms. So my, my overarching answer on that is the, the rate induced tipping is grossly understudied. So we just need to do, we firmly need to do more work on that. And you could arguably say the same about the noise induced tipping. Although I think to be fair, we kind of study the noise and we study the tipping, but we have different people <laughs> focused on them. So that's a great incentive to come together, perhaps to get a better collective understanding on that. And I think we all read the great news is we already have the statistical and physical framework to think about that phenomenon. Physicists have been studying what they call mean first exit time or passage time, you know, the likelihood you're going to get knocked out of your current state as a function of what you can deduce about the stability of that state and what you know about the noise level or the extreme events. We can put that science together and give a sort of probabilistic judgment based on joining our science up there. So I think we're in a better place on that. Yeah, just, I don't have much to add, but I agree. I mean, it would be an exciting topic maybe to, to join the, the two areas together. And I definitely see a lot of potential there. Yeah, yeah thank you so much. Uh, definitely uh, seems like there's a lot of potential there. Maybe just a brief follow up. And um, this is a question that Victor Both can ask. Um, namely, um, does the ex increase in extreme events increase or decrease irreversibility? Because with large variability, the multi-stability of the system might actually disappear as the system could jump from one state to another. <laughs> but if that were true, we'd be on a real roller coaster ride. I mean, whether it made it more reversible, it would still be deeply unpleasant because you'd be getting bounced out of one regime into another, then you try and adapt to that. And before you knew it, you get bounced back into a different one. I mean, that's 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 a nightmare for any any of us or for uh, or for what, what economists call the social planners or the policy makers or anyone trying to manage the situation. Yeah, yeah I and I think there would still be some tipping points that would be really truly irreversible if you're saying, uh, for instance, of the Amazon rainforest. And there maybe we have also other elements that contribute to making this 
tipping points even weaker. I mean, deforestation happening right now. And, and there, I don't see how, I mean, if you have more variability, you would not get back from this. I mean, you need the trees to, to grow back. So um, yeah, I think there are some limits to, you know, what you could do in a mathematical model compared to what would happen in, in the physical world, yeah. There's a question from Michael Evans, which relates to something I was going to ask. He says, how confident are we that we know the pre-anthropogenic probability of extremes? And, and maybe to amplify on that a bit, Tim, you mentioned paleo as one of your three pillars of evidence, but I didn't hear you mention paleo in your talk. So I would ask both of you, how, how much do you think paleo is being used enough to constrain extreme events or tipping point possibilities? Um, no might be the short answer. I'm sure it could be used more, Steve. I mean, Vic, Victor Brobkin just headed up a paper with myself and several others on in Nature Geoscience, where um, we, we try to shine a bit more light on this issue and point out that we can learn not just about individual tipping points, but also cascading interactions from the climate to ecological to social systems with the new, the ever growing amount of information we get from the past, whether it's the recent past or the slightly less recent past. I feel that this is a cultural thing. This is still the echoes that of how contemporary some subset of contemporary climate science and weather forecast that's grown out of weather forecast modeling isn't necessarily that well connected to a different branch of paleoclimate science that's come from geoscience and proxy measurement and come to models on its own way i mean a lot of us do overlap both areas but somehow there's still, a, I feel, to be to be honest, a little bit of a cultural gulf we could continue to get over together there. Um, for me, until we have, when we say we have a state-of-the-art model, to me, if it cannot reproduce known past abrupt climate changes, and still I haven't seen a model that produ reproduces the abrupt Sahara browning or the or the Dan Scott Oshka events with realistic forcing that would also claim to be a state-of-the-art model for century scale projection. Until we're there, I don't think we're in the best place. Uh, I know all the caveats and difficulties and the computational expense of, of trying to, to, to be able to do both. But for me, I'd, I'd be I feel we were in a stronger position of speaking to society when we when we had those tools at our disposal. Mm. Yeah, maybe if I add on this, definitely I think we can learn more from paleoclimate data. On the other hand, I would also maybe uh, moderate this expectation. I mean, as I said at the beginning, one main conclusion of the IPCC report is that the conditions we are in are, uh, you know, unprecedented in you know, uh, in the for the, for several. Uh, uh, thousands of years or more. So, I mean, the rate of change as mentioned is more than uh, 2,000 years. The uh, level of uh, temperature is uh, more than 100,000 years. And so, realizing also that we don't have a true analog for what we're experiencing right now might be also a point that we need to, to keep in mind. Maybe we can learn uh, just uh, <laughs> what we can learn is limited, and that's why it's truly dangerous. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Um, I'm going to let uh, one of our panel members, Gabby uh, Hagel, ask a quick question and then um, pass it back to Ricarda to say a bit more about what's happening on the um, Miro board and future activities that we can invite people to get involved in. So first, Gabby. Thanks. Um, thanks, um, um, Tim and, and Sonia for really great talks. Um, Sonia, I was wondering what, um, what do you think would be um, the immediate research needs to improve our understanding of, of um, tipping points linked to extremes. We have, in theory, we have um, Earth system models that have some of the components in there, but I suspect that we don't really trust how they, for example, how the vegetation responds. Um, and um, so I was wondering what we what we should do and how well we understand um, tipping points driven by multiple ex um, spatially concurrent extremes. That's a really good point. And I <laughs> I mean, it, it is extremely complex. So, so um, um, I mean, I'm, I, I expect that there would be some connection again with this co-occurrence of events, and then uh, the global tipping points. This has not been sufficiently 
investigate and one idea could be to do sensitivity experiments i think in the in the model so you could uh, go on the line of uh, using storylines you know where you look at different scenarios for possible compound events which have some, some probability of happening and then you look at whether this would affect when those tipping points are being hit in, in climate models i think that could be very uh, insightful yeah. Yeah, thanks so much. Um, and uh, as Stephen already pointed out, there's already some ongoing activity in the MIRO board, and I invite everyone to also head over there and check out the link and um, pose any additional questions. But also, we want to hear from you. Um, I mean, there are lots of experts here with us in the room uh, on tipping points and extreme events. So um, we're really interested to also hear your take on things and um, yeah, just learn from you and build up this community. So this MIRO board will um, stay up. Up, um, for the foreseeable future and we will keep engaging um, in that way so um, if you're interested in doing that um, just uh, leave your comments uh, remarks questions um, together with your name on, on that board and um, one of the um, points you will find on that board is actually on uh, a joint activity that uh, we're starting uh, with the earth commission together with AIMS and WCRP and that's on the tipping point model into comparison project so um, in short, TIPMIP, and I just briefly wanted to introduce that here. So the idea is, of course, with given all of these uh, uncertainties and risks, uh, we think it's high time that we actually have a model into comparison project on tipping points in uh, all these different um, elements that um, uh, Tim already introduced in, in his talk. So our idea is um, to launch a TIPMIP, a tipping point model into comparison project, um, with the main idea of um, yeah, looking at the different critical thresholds, um, further reducing uncertainty, but then also looking at feedbacks between the tipping elements and um, trying to quantify the feedback strengths and also direction between the different tipping elements. So this is the rough idea with the objective to assess these critical temperature thresholds um, and the feedbacks between those tipping elements. And we envision three main experiments. Um, one would be a baseline experiment uh, where we look at changes through climate and land use change on longer timescales, so multicentennial to multimillennial if possible. But this is supposed to be a come as you are approach. So we will start off in phase one of the tip MIP by um, looking at individual tipping elements. And that means that we also invite um, modeling groups that um, for instance, have a, a vegetation model only or a, an ocean model only or an ice sheet model only. So really looking at the individual tipping elements first, but of course also earth system models um, wherever possible. And then the second experiment would be a commitment experiment. So we're looking at committed impacts here. So when we branch off at given times or temperatures, um, what are the committed versus the realized impacts um, at that given time? And then the third experiment uh, will be a reversibility experiment where we um, want to assess the reversibility or irreversibility of certain changes and therefore also the hysteresis behavior. So this is just really a very brief overview um, of what we're working on in terms of an experimental protocol. Um, but we already wanted to introduce that here and invite all of you to be part of the TIPMIP. And if you're interested in that, um, we invite you to leave your, your name and email address in that my report. There's actually a section there, um, interest in the TIPMIP. Um, so if you're interested, please sign up and then we will follow up shortly with some more information and we will invite you to a workshop specifically dedicated to discussing these experiments and the way forward. So that's just very briefly on the tip MIP. And officially, our time for the, this first discussion series is, uh, is actually up, but we will stick around for um, another 20 minutes or so and keep discussing. So if you're still interested, um, let's keep going. And there are many more questions in the Q&A box, actually. Um, so um, I, I would say let's pick up some of those and um, yeah, just keep discussing for now. Um, and yeah, I think there, there are lots of questions on, um, on individual tipping elements as well. So if there's, there's one that um, we should discuss in particular, we can do that now. 
Otherwise, I would also have a question on the early warning methods. One of the questions I always um, ask myself is what are the limitations in terms of the temporal and also the spatial scale? So uh, since there's also the possibility of um, using spatial <laughs> early warning signals. So maybe you can comment on that and um, the possibilities, but also limitations for that. I'll have a go at that one, Ricarda, um, without trying to baffle everybody completely. So when I showed a little movie with an early warning signal, we were making several mathematical, physical or theoretical assumptions. Um, a key one is that we can separate time scales in what we're thinking about. So in the ideal case, we want to have three different time scales. One is the time scale of the, what I call the noise, short term variability, which we'll call the weather in the sake of, for the sake of argument in the climate. That needs, there's that fast time scale. Then there's a time scale of the dynamics of tipping, um, which should be like an intermediate time scale, preferably separated from the slower than the noise. And then there should be a, a slower time scale again, which is I'm forcing the system slowly by the global warming, let's say, in simple terms. And if they're well separated, which in some cases they are and in some cases they aren't, but if they are well separated, then, and there is a tipping point, then the sort of theory that certainly does, does work and is general, whether it can still work when you don't meet all those conditions is a topic of active research, shall we say. But what that should lean us towards is um, there is some, some sort of intermediate timescale tipping elements might be good candidates for applying this approach. And that's why I chose to look at the Amazon rainforest, because we know it's got this sort of decade or timescale that's faster than the centennial forcing and um, slower than the short term extreme events and variability. That said, I also showed you some examples which Nicholas Bors and others have published where uh, a priori you might say, oh, I thought that was too slow a system to show this signal, for example, the Arctic overturning and the, and the Greenland case. But in their analysis, which is rather elegant of the Greenland case, they, you know, they make quite a good case that for changes in the surface elevation and mass balance of Greenland on the scale they look at it, it, can, it is behaving quite fast, which is interesting. So we're not actually looking at like the slow dynamics of the slow movement of the ice sheet to, to reset the surface height or whatever. So uh, the short version of that would be, hmm, there's probably more work to do to check where these signals would or wouldn't be valid. But as we hinted at earlier, there's another attack, which is even if you don't get that type of early warning signal, you combine um, the expertise on how, how the extreme events and all the other variability is changing with an attempt just to deduce how stable a configuration am I in or not. Uh, so you're not trying to deduce whether stability is changing. You're just getting a one a one shot handle on how stable is my system. And those two pieces of information together is, is enough to go on to start um, making estimates. If you believe there's another state to make phys physical estimates of how likely or unlikely it is to get bumped out of the valley you're in and into some other place. <laughs> So any of you want to jump in on that one? Uh, no, that's fine. Thanks. I, well, I, I have another question that's related, though, to ask you, and that is, what do you think of Tim's idea at the end of his talk, where he uh, claims that the increasing variability of temperature uh, in Asia is indication of an approaching tipping point? I, I have to say, I'm I'm skeptical. Yeah. So <laughs> but I I'm think... curious what you think. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So. Uh... So it's, I thought about this uh, already a uh, long time ago. It was a workshop also co-organized by, by Victor. I mean, this idea of early detection, you know, early warning for tipping points, it makes me uh, think very much also what we see about so much of feedbacks. And I, I think it's a type of tipping points, but it's a regional tipping points, if you want. So in a uh, in given region, uh, if you don't have strong so much limitation, you basically heat events are going to be damped. And then once you get into this almost a regime, you are going to start with much more variability with much more frequency of hot events. And then at the end, you could reach a new status where you have this dry climate condition 
which I think fits perfectly in this tipping point idea, but it's more of a regional, if you want, the regional tipping points. It's, it's this region sh shifting its climate regime, but it does fit in the overall concept, I would say, yeah. That's interesting, because I was about to say to Steve, I, I wasn't, I, I didn't mean to come across as saying, I thought that was a firm example of a tipping point. Actually, what I was trying to get across, let me try it another way, is when we're trying to interpret things like um, the extraordinary heat wave in northwestern central North America, especially into Canada this summer, what conceptual framework are we going to take to that? Our dominant attribution framework is we think we've got a distribution and it's moving if it's a temperature distribution it's moving up as the temperature goes up maybe we also convince ourselves that the, the sort of kurtosis is changing the tails are stretching but another way to think about something like that heat wave is well you know it's it reflects a particular um wave pattern mode around the northern hemisphere i can't remember which one it was but there are different you know this better than i do there are different wave modes is it a different way to interpret it that you know a different wave pattern mode might become more frequent in the future and we certainly see that in some climate models and sonia's not it because she publishes her stuff and then I, my hypothesis what i'm asking us to think about is is a different conceptual way of trying to rationalize that event to think about it as flickering into a different mode that and then you flicker out isn't that statistically i find it easier to rationalize the reason some really extreme recent extremes in terms of a flickering not in terms of just linearly moving the existing distribution because it gets spectacularly hard to statistically interpret some of the most recent events in terms of just linearly moving the current distribution yeah no definitely so i think you you could possibly explain this with some uh, type of regional tipping points, for instance, in terms of some moisture feedbacks, as I mentioned, about the change in circulation patterns is also still debated whether there is actually an effect or not. Uh, but I mean, this could be another possible explanation that you have increased persistence. And so we are going in different modes there in terms of circulation uh, patterns. Uh, I think that the main issue we have is, yeah, we cannot exclude them. Uh, at, if we are speaking of some moisture feedback, I think it does fit mathematically in this concept. But again, it would be more regional. Uh, of course, change in large scale circulation patterns would have uh, impacts, you know, across the globe. Um, so, so yes, it does fit, does fit there. But for instance, this event in Canada was it was extreme, definitely. On the other hand, it affected one part of the globe, so its probability was a still small one in the. A thousand year event more or less but but it, it basically it still was possible that it would happen and uh, uh, so I think we would need more data I think that may be one of the main issues with detecting uh, these tipping points maybe after we have crossed the tipping point several decades afterwards we'll have enough data to say yeah we, we would have seen it I think the main issue is how do you monitor this in real time how do you make sure that you see something and that's because yes this event was totally unusual but it can still happen that means that you have some some outliers so when do you determine that it's not only a question of outliers but actually a real statistical trend and there the, the problem is things are changing so quickly that we may not have enough data to to look at this in real time yeah ricardo do you want to yeah, in your presentation, you also um, um, introduced, um, well, tipping cascades on the one hand, but then also compound extreme events on, on the other hand. So I was just wondering, what is your take on sort of the biggest gaps or the, the highest risks when it comes to this interaction of, of tipping elements on the one hand, and then also to compound events on, on the other hand? Uh, if I have a first go at it, I think... This is a topic where we really could do better and get stuck in on the science of this. What we need to do is we need to bring in that information about transition timescales and impacts unfolding if we do cross tipping points, because this is a time dependent problem. And as yet, we're not really seeing any state of the art analysis that brings our best information on that together with the tipping likelihoods. 
And what it's sort of intellectually exciting about this for someone like me is this is a classic complexity science problem where the tools for analyzing cascades in networked phenomena have got so much better in a general scientific sense that they're busy being applied to worrying about why we had the 2008-9 financial crash or a, another systemic risk problem. As a climate science community, we need to get with it on those tools and just bring them into our domain with our best science. And we're, in my view, I think we would move ahead well if we worked with some of the general complexity science specialists who've refined that toolkit. Um, and yeah, I, it's not an easy problem, but it's a super important one. So it's one of these things where you want a Manhattan project or a or something to raise the bar and you kind of need to take some of us out of all the burdens of the day job whoever those some of us are and and like put them give them some special time and space to to raise the bar of the science of this because it's it's clear that it can be done but it needs a, i think it needs a it's worth a focused effort that's my take on it yeah, I think personally, the, the point on which I'm uh, most concerned, and I think we need to, to uh, study better, is these possible tipping points in the coupled human Earth system. So basically, uh, I mean, our society, uh, what are possible impacts on us? And also, I mean, there could be also feedbacks in terms of CO2 emissions through this coupled human system, you know, in terms of uh, uh, possibly uh, additional emissions because it's getting... Uh, too hot and you have more cooling system and so on. Uh, so uh, I feel there is not enough consideration of this and especially with the compound events. So when you have several regions being affected at the same time, what could be the impact? And also when would we reach tipping points for society? I mean, when would be would be we would we be no longer able to adapt because for instance, also neighbors cannot help each other out. I think these elements have not been sufficiently considered. So what are the social tipping points uh, which would have you know, major impact for us, maybe even before physical global tipping points is reached? Thank you. That seems like an important topic for maybe one of the future events in our discussion series. Stephen? Uh, I agree. I was actually going to ask about that because there's quite a lot of, um, I'm looking over briefly at the Miro board and a, a number of people have raised this uh, idea of human system physical tipping point interactions. Do you have any further thoughts on strategies for doing, I mean, it, it, it kind of seems overwhelmingly difficult, um, but, but it's clearly important. And, and we just had a tipping point in Afghanistan, which makes me think, which nobody seemed to see coming which is the kind of thing that you'd like to be able to force, even if you don't know it's gonna happen, at least see that it might happen. Any idea on how we could catch these things? I, I can say a bit more, Steve, because I'm, cause of, <laughs> I'm not just a climate scientist, I work on some other systems and data. Um, so for example, since the eight, nine financial crash, a lot of work has gone into working out has the system of lending money, um, and debt, passing debt around, got more stable or not, or, or got less stable. And happily, the answer is it's got a whole lot more stable, thanks to some deliberate lessons learned from that. We know a lot about what goods and commodities we trade, um, who trades what to whom. So we basically know a lot about the global economic trade network, as well as the, cap the network of capital I described to start with. Uh, people in this webinar, between us probably know a lot about um, climate and weather extremes. And then it becomes about um, having a nested network model that captures the causal interactions across the sort of the layers or the phenomena. Well, that's where it gets a bit trickier. And sometimes you're doing kind of econometrics. You're just looking at correlation and you're not hundred percent sure it is causal. And you're, and you're bound by the realm of past experience in econometrics, and you know that you're going into places you haven't experienced in the past. So there's a clear research agenda there. We, as process-based climate modelers, need to bring a, bring a bit more of that process-based thinking into the impacts domain, basically, so that we're not just going to be guided by econometrics of past experience, because that's no guide to a, a experience in climates and weather and stuff we haven't done. But I hope we gave you a few clues that there are 
there's quite a lot of foundations to build from. Um, it's not a hopeless situation. Uh, but yeah, I come back to you, you're echoing in a sense my point that we would need this really needs some smart people to be given some time and 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 resource to, to have a proper go at this as a kind of a I don't think I should call it a Manhattan project. Someone come up with a better name in the chat, but <laughs> okay, yeah, so okay. all That's smart a, people uh, listening sign up. I have uh, maybe Sorry, a few ahead. points also, maybe to to answer this uh, question, which is a, a good one. Uh, so, I mean, I think a first element, and it's actually something we have been working on in our group, is trying to couple those systems. So, I mean, within the IPCC framework, we have models for these different elements. So the human system is covered with integrated assessment models, which have limitations because they are mostly guided, again, by economical uh, consideration, but still uh basically we have those models but, but again the feedbacks are not sufficiently integrated as they do take into account uh, changes in global temperature they don't take into account change in extremes and uh, so we have been working on the emulator for climate extremes because we find in climate models whether it's correct or not but the extremes more or less change uh, linearly so so but by integrating this feedback we can see if there are tipping points in climate action so for instance if we say okay we, we want to plant more forests to take up co2 at some point those forests might not survive because you have too much risk of fires so you could integrate basically this feedback and i think this is one important aspect where i mean we could get results fairly quickly and find out you know whether those scenarios with low emission scenario whether, whether they are realistic and at which point of global warming it doesn't get it's not realistic anymore to, to assume some CDR scenarios that are very substantial. Um, the second point, uh, what you mentioned about vitriol uh, trades, I think this is really important. We had done a small study a few years ago where we looked at vitriol water trades uh, uh, to uh, together with Ariane Extra, and that was really fascinating. So as we looked at the impact of changing water cycle for um, basically, uh, yeah, water trades in, in different countries and basically there's their food supplies. And, and interestingly, some uh, regions which actually uh, don't seem to be very much affected by, uh, by droughts like uh, Russia, well, it is affected, but maybe that's not the first country you think of, was substantially affected because they import a lot of goods from uh, Central Asia, which is very strongly affected by droughts. On the other hand, a country like Spain that is drying out imports a lot of goods from, from Northern Europe. And so you see as also as a connections there between countries in, in, about their resilience or vulnerability under changing climate. So last point I would want to mention is of course those social tipping points would not only be negative. There could be some positive tipping points in terms of climate action. And I think that would be also worth really studying if you want to you know, push forward and, and have a chance of uh, changing the, the curve of CO2 emissions. And I think that would be extremely valuable as well. I think we need a tipping point for climate action. Uh, if we extrapolate linearly, we're not doing very well. Um, I think we probably want to wrap up now. Um, I'd like to thank the two speakers again and, and give a little bit of round of applause, which we didn't do before, uh, for their presentation. And we've managed to hold on to about two thirds of the people that started off even after 90 minutes. So I think that's an indicator that we've um, done all right. and. Uh, Ricardo, do you want to say any last words? Well, just a, a huge thanks to our speakers, of course, uh, and the other panelists, but then also um, to our audience. And we're very much looking forward to continuing this in about a month's time. Um, we will have the next uh, seminar on uh, the, the ice sheets as tipping elements uh, in the Earth system, and then we'll follow up from there. So if you're interested in receiving further information on this, um, please check out the, the website where you also found uh, the sign up link for this event and, and we will follow up uh, via email as well. And again, if you're interested in the tip, if you have further questions or comments, just feel free to send us also an email and we will follow up there. So thanks again, and uh, yeah, we can't wait for the next seminar, and we are very much looking forward to that. Thanks. Yep. Bye, everybody. Thank Bye, you. Everybody. Bye. Thank you.